Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to another virtual breakfast. I can't remember how many we've been through, but um, we, we've got to be in the teens at least. So uh, we want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we didn't, if we didn't have all these people to attend, we probably wouldn't have a program, so we appreciate it. We have Dr. Brooke Wilkie with us. Uh, he manages our LTAR farm um, over at the Kellogg Biological Station. And he also is joined by his really loud but wonderful sounding rooster. So you will always also get that today. Thanks, Monica. We were joking that it's sort of like a master's soundtrack. You know, if you watch the masters on TV and they have the birds in the background, which I'm still not sure if they're real or not, but this is real country style soundtrack this morning for this presentation. So the roosters will come and go probably. <laughs> so bear with me. <laughs> All right, I'm here to talk about cover crops after wheat. Um, we've got wheat harvest um, coming up, as many as many of you know. And so um, this morning, instead of, well, instead of diving into all the reasons why you might want to plant cover crops after wheat, I really wanted to focus in on a couple of them that I think are incredibly important um, reasons why you would want to plant cover crops after wheat. And then I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about species options and some economics and costs of what it would cost you to plant each of these different cover crops. But um, the two reasons that I really wanted to focus on uh, were weed management and nitrogen fixation. So weed management, as, as I've gone through the years of managing our research project, we have many, you know, we have plots and we have fields. So I've seen a lot of different scales and so forth. And I've realized that weed escapes can be a really big problem after wheat if you don't manage that. And uh, many of you have probably seen that too. And I've also realized that um, if you control those weeds after wheat harvest that are there, and then you plant a cover crop that's pretty good at suppressing the weeds, you can really, really suppress them and also gather some other benefits that we're also looking uh, for from cover crops as well that many of you probably are familiar with. And then with the prices of nitrogen, I'm assuming that there are a lot of questions out there about, you know, I've got wheat, I've got this opportunity to grow a cover crop. Maybe I can grow some nitrogen for my, my corn crop next year after wheat. So we're gonna dive into what the species options are for legumes, uh, roughly, you know, kind of some guiding ideas of how much nitrogen you could expect to gain from those legumes in, in that rotation. And then a little bit about like, thinking about how to measure and estimate that for your corn crop. And of course, there's all kinds of other reasons that you would want to plant a cover crop um, for soil health and erosion control and so forth. We're not going to go deep into that today or focus on those two primary, primary reasons. All right, so uh, weeds that are a problem for us, and I assume for many of you, include mare's tail is probably the number one that um, we deal with after wheat. Um, seems like no matter what we do, we've always got those plants floating around. Uh, water hemp is becoming a problem in some areas. I know uh, ragweed likes to grow aggressively after wheat. Crabgrass, I've seen that get out of control. Lamb's quarters, and you could probably go down the list of other weeds that, that can show up after wheat. Um, Volunteer wheat, of course, is always going to show up in those fields, and that one is, is not that much of a concern of mine, but we can try to control that as well if, if it is a concern. So the first thing you've got to do is kill your emerged weeds after wheat. And a lot of times we have what appears to be fairly clean um, fields at wheat harvest, depending on your weed control during crop um, the crop season. But even so, there are often times little tiny weeds that have emerged and are hard to notice. So, so scout your field, figure out what's there, and then use an herbicide um, that will kill the weeds and uh, or some light tillage or something like that to kill the, the emerged weeds. And then the cover crops that are, um, I would highly recommend for planting, if you're really looking for weed suppression, uh, control those weeds and then get some other benefits. First and foremost, oats and radish is a super, super easy one to go with. And that one um, is is highly, it's, it's, it's done quite often. Um, it can be fairly inexpensive. I've tried to put the rough cost and the planting rate here in my slides. So we're gonna go with 30 to 60 pounds 
per acre of oats plus just a couple of pounds of radish uh, is enough to really get the field covered. It's going to run you twenty to forty dollars per acre. The radish in that mix can be a really great weed suppressor. Uh, brassicas, radishes as in the brassica family and brassicas in general are really good at suppressing weeds both in the season and uh, into the fall. Um, if you're trying to control winter annuals for the next year, oats and radish will both winter kill. So you would have a pretty clean slate to work with in the following spring. One caveat with this is that radishes probably shouldn't be planted before August 1st or so because they tend to, they can have a tendency instead of just building that root and leaves, they can have a tendency to bolt and produce flowers if you plant them too early in the summer. So you've got a little bit of time if you're going to go with this mix, but don't wait too long. Maybe around August 1st would be a good target to get that in the ground. Um, other brassicas that I mentioned, um, mustards, rape seeds, like dwarf Essex rape, um, kale, turnips, they can all be really great to add in. Most of our cropping systems don't have any brassica crops unless you're growing canola. And so it's a really good opportunity to add in a different type of plant as different properties. It, uh, won't, it won't likely carry diseases forward that your other crops um, would also harbor. And they can be fairly inexpensive. Dwarf, dwarf Essex rape planted at four pounds per acre may only cost you $5 per acre to plant. And so it's really inexpensive and uh, a really great option for controlling the weeds. Some of those will survive the winter and you'll have to terminate them the next spring, um, but they're not incredibly difficult to terminate. Another option I really like is uh, sorghum sedan or pearl millet, which are really fast growing grasses that uh, if planted in the summer, can, can put on a lot of biomass in a hurry, especially if you've got any livestock that you need to produce feed for, they can be really great options to produce feed in a hurry. And um, when you're sourcing these seeds, uh, make sure and determine if your goal is, is forage or not, because if it's not forage, the cost of the seeds can be a lot different. So you can get a basic sorghum sedan that may cost half as much per pound as a sorghum sedan that's designed for feed production. And so if you're just looking for quick cover, you know, some cheap sorghum sedan, they can get it for um, less than a dollar pound, throw it in the ground um, 15 to 30 pounds per acre, you'll have a great cover for the rest of the year. Something to keep in mind, you know, there's recommended seeding rates for these cover crops, but you don't have to plant the full seeding rate. Um, oftentimes planting even half of the, the highest seeding rate that's recommended can give you quite a lot of biomass. For example, if you plant half the seeding rate, you'll get more than 50% of the biomass you would get from the full seeding rate. You just want to make sure you plant enough that you're going to get good, good coverage and control the weeds that we're trying to control. Um, all of the cover crops that we plant after wheat need to be incorporated. Surface spreading won't, won't work or will rarely work. You don't want to count on moisture, consistent moisture to get just surface applied seeds to grow in the middle of the summer. So plan on either drilling them in, planting them in, or um, maybe a, a light tillage activity with an air seeder or something like that to get those cover crops established. And then be creative with how you maybe think about rows for these cover crops. One thing to maybe think about would be if you're going to go to corn and you're growing oats and radish, maybe you don't mix the oats and radish completely together. Maybe you grow them in separate rows with the idea that your corn is going to follow the radishes instead of the oats um, if you're going to no-till the next year, potentially. So you can be creative with that. And many of our planters or drills maybe have multiple hoppers that you can put seeds in different rows. And that's an option to think about as you're putting these in. All right, um, legumes. So most of us know that legumes are nitrogen fixers and they accumulate more nitrogen than most other plants because they can work with a bacteria to grab it from the atmosphere and then store it in their tissues. And so when we kill those legumes, they will release that nitrogen for our subsequent crops. And ones that are grown for cover crops. Uh, red clover is potentially the most familiar one. Uh, 
historically people have used red clover in wheat uh, as a frost seeded cover crop. So some people already have this planted in March or maybe early April. And then once the wheat comes off, it's there and ready to harvest or ready to, to take off. It'll be freed from that competition of the wheat. If you haven't done that already, it's still not too late to put in red clover. Uh, you can drill it in after wheat harvest. It does need to be fairly shallow planted and so you need some moisture um, to get it going, but you can plant it. Um, six to 12 pounds per acre is a good target rate. And you'll you see 20 to 30, 20 to 40 pound or 20 to $40 is what you're gonna spend. Again, be careful of what varieties you choose. There are forage varieties that cost a lot more than cover crop varieties. And so you can end up spending more in a hurry if you're not picky. We have some annual legumes too that are fairly common. Hairy vetch is one that is um, a very, very high biomass producer and can give you a lot of nitrogen fixation in a hurry. Um, hairy vetch also is known to have hard seed, which means that not all the seed will germinate in the first year. So you tend to have some carryover into subsequent years. And when we're conventional farming, um, corn, soybeans following wheat, that's usually not a problem. It's easy to control. Uh, where we run into problems with hairy vetch sometimes is in organic systems. When you have um, small grains in the rotation, you get hairy vetch that can be hard to control in wheat. And then we get seeds harvested at the same time. So um, don't, don't be scared of it, but know that uh, if you're looking for that big nitrogen boost, that might be the best option, but you might have to manage a little bit of weeds and the hairy vetch escapes in subsequent years. Um, crimson and other annual clovers, um, they can be planted, although most of these annual clovers do better in su more southern areas of our country. Uh, we've experimented with many of them and it's sort of hit or miss whether we get good establishment and whether we get a fair amount of growth. So um, feel free to play around with those. They can be effective, but don't, don't also um, expects to have, you know, a perfect stand and a perfect growth year one. Some of them winter kill, some of them may survive the winter. So you have to play around in your climate. Then we have some summer um, warm loving legumes like sun hemp, cow peas, and even soybeans make a, a reasonable cover crop after wheat. And those are really growing fast in the summer. Um, they need heat. If you don't get the heat, if you don't get the moisture, you won't get that much growth and they will winter kill. So um, you don't have to worry about them the next spring, but it might limit the amount of nitrogen you'll get from them as well. How do we predict how much nitrogen to credit from the legumes? Well, it's not easy, honestly. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, did you grow a monoculture legume or a mixture with grasses or something else? Uh, how much biomass did you accumulate by the time it was dead um, or terminated? Uh, the termination method, did you spray it to kill it or did you till it in? If you tilled it in, you're likely to release the nitrogen faster because you're going to stimulate that decomposition. The nitrogen is going to get released faster. You may get more of it in that first year, whereas if you spray it, leave the residue on the surface, it might be slower to release. and. Uh, Maybe some of it show up later in, in your crop cycle or um, potentially even in subsequent years. And then if you're gonna do this, if you're really thinking about planting a legume for next year, um, I would say go conservative with your whole field, but think about using um, some nitrogen rate trials in your field to think, you know, investigate on your own field. How much nitrogen did I gain and where did my yield losses start? Monica, how am I doing on time? I see you showed up on the screen. Yeah, this was a warrant. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm checking you. So if you could finish up here in a couple right. minutes. We're expecting um, no more than 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen available from these legumes, um, depending on those factors that I mentioned. And if, if Phil or Monica, if you could put this link in the chat, Oregon State has a great publication that gives us lots of tools and ideas to help predict how much nitrogen we're going to get from the legumes. So. Um, Take a look at that if you're interested, but um, don't credit yourself any more than 100 pounds. Maybe, you know, 75 pounds might be a good estimate at max if you have the best legume stand in the world. And then uh, approach it conservatively, but do expect to gain some nitrogen. Okay, last slide. Just to point out, 
Um, when we're growing cover crops, uh, the percent nitrogen in the cover crops, these black dots on the screen, the filled in ones are from legumes or legume mixtures. And notice how they're all above two and a half percent nitrogen. And then grass or other non-legume cover crops are less than two and a half percent nitrogen. And we typically think of two percent nitrogen in the plant material as the sort of the line when we're going to have nitrogen release from the cover crop. And if it's less than 2% nitrogen, it's actually going to tie up some nitrogen in the soil for our subsequent crop. So, so be careful of that with your cover crops and kind of know what you're getting into so that you can plan for, am I going to get nitrogen release or am I going to get nitrogen tie up and have to add more in for my next year's corn crops? All right, I'll stop there. That's what I've got today. Thank you all. Uh, yeah, thank you, Brooke. And so at this point, we're going to open it back up to Q&A. Um, what are you doing to help prevent slugs and creating a wet mat in the spring of the following year? Oh, um, that's a different, you know, that's a difficult one. I don't have the magic answer. Um, I, do, um, I do know that if you, well, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer. Does anybody else have Usually slow questions, we do have a specialist from OSU that we communicate with often, and so uh, they're not that common in my area, actually, slug issues, and I typically um, uh, ask her, <laughs> so I don't even have a great answer to that, uh, Peter, but if you wanted to private message me your contact information, I'd be happy to send that along. Um, and then what weed control options are there for frost seeded clover and winter wheat? There are very few um, grass herbicides, which are, you know, questionable whether we, you know, really should be using them. We really have to need it in wheat to use them. And then I believe MCPA is the only other herbicide that you can apply in season on wheat with red clover already planted. But most of our other broadleaf herbicides if you've already got the clover seeded, we'll probably take out that clover as well in the wheat season. Brooke, have you seen any problems with radishes plugging field tile? I don't have any experience with that. I know I've, I've heard um, other, other people be concerned about that. We do not have any tiles in our part of Southwest Michigan. And so I can't answer. Monica, you work in more um, locations with tile. What's your experience? Yeah, I have had people with problems. Um, it can be hit or miss. A lot of times it has to do with the, like a low spot in the field, more vulnerable area of that field um, where there's not as much uh, buffer there, right? Soil. But uh, I also have, like, I was out on a farm recently and they said they've had them, they clear them, and, but it was worth it to them uh, to just have a couple plugged areas that they had to deal with. And so um, it's a pretty broad uh, mixture. I've had people that don't have any issues. Um, and then on farms that have had issues, it seems like a lot of it is in certain areas. Um, and then, yeah. Something to consider would be just delaying the planting a little bit later so you don't get your radishes so sure. big, right? To get that deep and plug up if you wait until September 1st or so. You don't wanna wait until late September, October. You won't get enough growth then, but you know, September 1st, you would still have time to get adequate growth. Yeah. So Monica and Brooke, uh, Dr. Hassan Ghane talked about this a couple weeks ago when he explained that many times tile that have a, a dip in them will actually accumulate water. And if that water is in those tile, many times those roots will find that water. And so sometimes it's a matter of the tile having just a little bit of slope or a little bit of a drop and water accumulating, and that will cause those plants to really go towards that. And they'll find water and they'll find it in, in pretty good amount. So uh, if that happens, that that's, could be one of the challenges um, associated with radishes, but sometimes there's an underlying uh, problem or challenge that's also associated with that. Yeah, that makes sense, Phil. Thank you. All right. Next one is how do people manage wheat stubble and covers in the spring to prevent a wet mat from forming? So obviously, if you feel like you have too much residue, any sort of tillage can help um, to, to break that up. Some, some surface, you know, vertical till uh, or more aggressive tillage, if that's a big problem. But I think in most cases, um, 
you have you have two options if you're going to be no tilling and leaving the residue there one would be to have good sort of uh, row cleaner type options on the planter you're using to push that residue out of the way and that way you don't have you know that least that residue in the row but you push it kind of between the rows if that's not an option um, you can't so so sometimes we get caught in this middle ground of difficulty when we're terminating cover crops uh, like a week or so before planting and you have all this residue and it and it's sort of dead and it kind of becomes hard to chat to move it's a little bit wet um, so we either want to kill it earlier than that you know get it really dead so that it's dry and brittle and kind of breaks apart when we go through the field or especially if we're planting soybeans, just wait until after you plant to terminate the cover crop so that it's still green. So it's easier to plant into if it's green or if it's, you know, really dead and brown and, and brittle. Um, that sort of middle ground is where it can become more difficult to deal with when, you know, with our planting equipment. We had a couple comments on here. Um, Paul mentioned that there's a bait deadline that can be used for slugs if you're having issues or one other herbicide comment monica and i don't i don't know if christy's on this morning but christy is working on trials to evaluate the impact of wheat applied herbicides to cover crops planted after wheat harvest because there are some rotation restrictions for products such as stinger that uh, would potentially damage cover crops planted after the wheat. And so that research is ongoing. And um, I assume more information will be coming out. Uh, I know in the first year, I didn't, there weren't a lot of, um, there wasn't much damage to subsequently applied cover crops. We had a lot of rain last summer before the cover crops were planted. And so that can Im implicate how well uh, the cover crops do. Um, someone just asked, what are your thoughts on a pre-side dress nitrate test? That's a great question. I was going to bring that up um, and I forgot, but so we can't exclusively rely on a PSNT test in corn to evaluate nitrogen from cover crops because not all the nitrogen is available yet. It might give us an idea of where we're starting, but if you kill the cover crop, it might, especially if you no-till, it might take a couple months for that nitrogen to become available. And so it might be hanging around still in that biomass and not free nitrogen in the soil yet. So um, I don't discourage you from using that. I think it's a good test to, to get started with your program. But um, if you've got a big legume cover crop, you might want to still credit some of that, even if it doesn't show up in that test when you're ready to side dress. Um, Phil, Phil is going to post a bulletin on termination methods for cover crops in the chat. So take a look at that if you're curious about other options for termination or just, just thinking that through. I do want to, um, you know, caution that planting green into legumes with corn um, is still, I would say, a risky business, right? Or planting green with corn is, is question, you know, there can, you can run into challenges. Soybeans are a lot more forgiving with planting green into cover crops. Corn, um, approach with caution if you're thinking of doing that. I'm not saying it won't work, but I'm also saying it may not work for you and your system. All right. And I just want to mention, since we have a little time, that we do have a cover crop soil health team. So if um, there's a farmer on here interested in starting into the use of cover crops, we do have a team throughout the state of Michigan that can come out to your farm, take a look, um, help you plan that, and then interact with researchers like Brooke um, to answer questions and devise a, a plan or a program to uh, hopefully get your first experience with cover crops to be a, a positive one. <laughs> so um, remember, we do have that option or uh, available to you. Well, at this time, I don't see, yes, at this time, I don't see any other questions. And so I'm going to open it up a little bit broader and see, um, I know we heard already from Dennis Pennington, but see if there's any other specialists on that would like to add anything, anything they're seeing out in the field, any uh, burning questions they've been getting. Hey, Monica. Um, hey, I, I just make a note, I guess, like a little bit of tar spots being found um, in surrounding states. It's pretty early for fungicide apps, but 
Um, just wanted to let people know it's starting to be found. Um, so I guess begin scouting and I would be looking in the lower canopy, especially those canopies that are, you know, larger now. Um, variety trials or, you know, variety strips is a really good place too, looking at different varieties. Um, and in any areas that are sort of lower or wetter, um, that, that'd be a good place to scout, so. All right, with that, I would say that uh, we have officially wrapped up another great virtual breakfast. Please join us again next week. Um, again, Marty will actually be on and we'll be discussing some of those uh, burning questions you have about our spot. So have a wonderful day.